Father, it's not our voice, it's yours that we Amen. need to hear. So Father, I pray through your servant John. I pray, Lord, that you will speak forth your word and these words will be anointed through our brother, through the spirit of the living God. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Thank you, Nigel. Amen. So, uh, I'm John. I'm the pastor of the old meeting here in Norwich, probably the oldest chapel in, in the Congregational Church, founded in 1643. But God hasn't got any older. He's just the same as he was. Yeah. I'm starting today. I like to have a title. It all depends on faith. Um, as individuals and as a church, we're seeking to have a closer walk with God and to experience his blessings in our lives. I believe that the most vitally important aspect in our spiritual lives is faith. It all depends on faith. Mm. All the treasures of heaven is only opened by faith. Mm. And all power is given to those who can believe. Amen. I'm starting today, with God's help, a series of talks on some of the dynamics of faith. Mm. Every Christian needs to understand what it means to believe and how to exercise their faith. Miracles and the supernatural were commonplace in New Testament days, but are sadly very seldom seen today in the lukewarm churches, mm. which are full of indifference and worldliness. Amen. We may well ask the Church of God why it lacks the old time power. Why is the fear of God no longer in our land? Why is there so little power to turn men and women to God among his people? I hope in these talks to provide a solution to receiving untold blessing and mm. how we may have a conquering faith in the name of Jesus. Mm and in the Word, and in the blood of Jesus. Praise God. The Bible tells us that all things, A-double-L, all things are possible to him yes. or Amen. her <laughs> who can in Jesus' name believe. So, everything depends on our total faith in Jesus. Mm. He is all in all. His salvation is perfect, but unless we believe and receive and appropriate and feed on him by faith in our hearts, it means nothing at all. We need then again and again to emphasise this, mm. the way and necessity of appropriating faith. Mark 11 and verse 22 tells us to have faith in God. And 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 says that we should examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. And that's what we're going to start doing today. Over and over again in the Bible, we read that Jesus was un unable to, for to perform miracles because of their lack of faith. We have a wonderful heritage of men and women who've gone before us and given us a wonderful example of what it means to have faith. This chapel has links to the Pilgrim Fathers who totally depended on God as they left these shores to establish a Christian settlement in the New World. In our weekly studies, Bible studies, we're encountering the great faith of the many of the Puritans who had nothing except their faith in God. Yeah. 
This faith often costs them their lives. I don't know if you've heard of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yes. He wasn't in Germany when the war started. He was lecturing in America and he didn't have to go back. But he felt compelled to go back and to lead the Lutheran Church in its resistance against the Nazis. Mm. And he, he, he ended up being caught because he was working against the Nazis and he was sent to, first of all, prison and then to concentration camp. And uh, one of the books that he wrote was called, it, he wrote about cheap grace and costly grace. And um, there's a book called Discipleship, which if you haven't read it, you must. Costly grace is seldom encountered in many churches today who have an easygoing believism. <laughs> mm -hmm. Faith is a mighty living thing Amen. which produces wonderful results in our lives. Today, with God's help, I want us to consider seven of its aspects as presented to us in the pages of the New Testament. Why seven, you may ask? <clears throat> well, seven is the biblical number for perfection. Yeah. If you look here, we have seven steps going up to our pulpit to remind us of that. Because the, the word of God is perfect. That's why we have seven steps going up to it. So I'm doing seven steps. The first step that we need to remember is that it's a mystery. We are reminded of that in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 9, which reads, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. In this verse, we see that faith is called a mystery, a divine mystery. And so it is. John Wesley used to speak of the interior eye of faith being opened by the Holy Ghost to see and appropriate the spiritual realities. Only those who have experienced that still have the ability to understand those words as it is truly a divine mystery in the soul revealed by the Holy Spirit. A man can receive nothing except it is given him from above. Yeah? yeah? God gives us so much, but it comes from above. Yeah. God is jealous of this law, so why is man unwilling to keep it? We love to think that by searching our Bibles and commentaries and books of reference, and thereby obtaining the clearest theological light on these things, can we find out God? But alas, tried, tired and disappointed, we are at last brought by his grace to see that we can only come to know the tenderness and love of the Father through the mystery of faith as revealed, as revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Our second step of faith is to see it as a seed. We are reminded, after all, in Matthew 17 and verse 20, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. We have here a simile applied to faith. At times, indeed, it is almost impossible to distinguish the little seed corn of some precious promise buried in the soul of the human heart from the wonderful principle of faith that captures it and fastens on it and so finds in it its life and substance. They appear, don't they, to be almost the same thing, a seed within which lies all motionless and silent, the wonderful dynamic of life, which only needs to be deposited in the soil 
which is its native element and environment adapted to its nature. And at once, the latent forces begin to stir and operate. Mm. And so it is with faith. Only let that divine thing be implanted within the soul by the Holy Spirit and it will at once start to cast out and bring in, to move and work in all its strange and silent power. All our desires, affections, emotions, thoughts and imaginations will be aroused from the apathy of selfishness and their sleep of death and spring forth and shoot upwards into the sunshine of the love of God to poor sinful humanity. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Mm. Amen. That latent power yeah. just needs the right and it comes to life, doesn't it? The third step is found in Hebrews 4 and verse 2, where we are reminded, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Here we have another discovery in the scriptures that faith is a principle and not a mere attitude towards God. <clears throat> it's a divine principle planted within the soul. We're speaking now, of course, of faith in its highest form. One of the best definitions of faith outside the Word of God is given by William Tyndale, who became a martyr mm. for translating the Bible into our mother tongue. This is what he says. Right faith is a thing wrought in us by the Holy Ghost, which changes us, turns us into a new nature, and begets us anew in God, and makes us sons of God, as thou readest in the first of John, and kills the old Adam, and makes us altogether new in the heart, mind, will, desire, and in all the other affections and powers of the soul, the Holy Ghost ever accompanying it and ruling the heart. Mm. Now here faith is defined as a thing wrought in us, and so it is. It's a divine principle, a blessed power that God gives and implants within. Stephen, we read, was full of faith. Mm. We yeah. cannot be full of an attitude, but we surely can be full of that divine light and sweetness and easiness of soul that enables us to rejoice in the Lord evermore. Amen. Now the fourth step is found in Hebrews 11 and verse 1, which you probably know off by heart. This is what it says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now it might be ur urged that if faith is the gift of God, we are helpless in the matter and can only wait until God implants it within us. Mm. But this is only an appearance as our text here teaches us that there are two degrees or forms of faith, a substance of things hoped for and a conviction of facts not seen. The Methodist, Mrs. Hester Ann Rogers, and it, you would really benefit by reading her works. She lived from 1756 to 1794. And with her wonderful insight, into spiritual things speaks as follows. The witness of the Spirit, she is here referring to the fullness of faith, is God's gift and not our act given to all who act faith in Jesus and the promise made through him. 
but it is not given until faith is acted upon. If we, as penitents, had no power to act faith, how would God be just in, be just in condemning us? It is after this act of faith, not believing before it, that God gives the witness of the Spirit. Mm. And so it surely is. God commanded us to believe because by his grace we can. As we do so and take sides with him against unbelief, that alchemy within our hearts, he bestows upon us and plants within us the holy conviction of his divine facts. The act of voluntary faith passes into the gracious state of believing. But one is certainly dependent on the other. We believe and God put the crown of assurance upon our faith. The fifth step is found in Hebrews 4.11 and John 6.29. And these are the verses. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. And, this, and John 6, Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. We get in these scriptures a still further view of faith. There is an active form and a passive form in believing in God. Putting away apathy and pride, we need to use the faith we have until the substance of things hoped for becomes a sweet assurance of facts not yet seen. It means much prayer, much searching of the word, and much crying to God to strengthen the things mm. that remain, mm. fearful lest Satan shall cheat us of our crown and, ca and cause us to go mourning all our days. Uh, uh, there's not many of them around today. Have you ever met a revivalist? Huh? I met one who came here, Michael Marcel, and um, he, he has a, a website called UK Wells, where he lists the great moves of God, and on that website, he talks about James Corley, that's C-A-U-G-H-E-Y, who was a great revivalist. And he lived from 1810 to 1891. Who's in, and you can find his details if you just go to that website. I think it's .org.uk. So it's ukwells.org.uk. And there's some amazing stories. The old meeting's on that map. <laughs> it's one of the spiritual wells of God. Um, and James has said that there is a difference between faith, as commonly understood, and believing. The one is like water at rest, whilst the other is like water in motion. Put a boat on a lake or some piece of stagnant water and it remains motionless. But put it on a river running 10 miles an hour mm. And to, his quaint, and to his quaint expression, it just moves. Mm. <laughs> and so it is with faith. Where there is a true faith, inwrought by the Holy Spirit, there is a labour to enter in, mm. which we read of in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. This is what it says. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Praise God. Mm. A stretching forth of the hands that brings us into the king's palace. And you find that in Proverbs 30 in verse 28. It says, a lizard can be caught with the hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. A going on 
unto perfection, as found in Hebrews 6 and verse 1. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God. <clears throat> it's a pressing towards the mark, mm. as mentioned in Philippians 3, 14. Oh, cool. This is, I love this verse. Yeah. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ mm. Jesus. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is yeah. calling us. It's a running so as to obtain, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. This is what it says. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Mm. It's also a seeking of the things that are found in Colossians 3 and verse 1. This is what it says. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above yeah. where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. All these things are true works of faith. This is the holy dynamic of the soul. St. Paul prayed for the Thessalonian Christians that, that God would fulfil every desire and goodness and every work of faith with power. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. It's blessed to have holy desires and desire of goodness, to dwell in the house of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Mm, Psalm 27 and verse 4. To feed on the sincere milk of the word. 1 Peter 2 verses 1 and 2. To see the salvation of men. Romans 10 verses 1 and 2. To have righteousness exceeding that of the Pharisees. A real loving thing. Matthew 5 and verses 6 and 20. To have Christ magnified in us, whether by life or death. Philippians 1 verses 20 and 23. But if our desires are only mere desires, if there is with them no work of faith, like the sluggard, we shall desire and have nothing. Mm. Let us see that faith is at work, stretching out its hand mm. to receive from him who waits to fill the hand and to fulfil the work of every believing soul. The sixth step is found in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Closely akin to the work of faith is its fight. Alas, we have not, mere, we have not mere, merely sluggishness of our own stupid hearts against which to contend, but an active enemy whose main work is to keep us from believing God. Mm. He knows that this is the victory that overcometh even our faith. Was it any wonder that Jesus himself said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes? Yeah. Amen. Note, be it noted, if you do, or will, or try to believe, but if you can. So it's not doing or willing, but it's can believe. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. We can all do that, can't we? <clears throat> yeah. Yes, here is the battle. The enemy seeks to lull us to sleep with a promise of triumph at some future time. 
or by pious phrases about the rest of faith and deceive us into thinking that we shall grow into Christ's image unconsciously? Without the battle of believing or any active outgoing of our hearts in aggressive acts of faith, oh, that we would awake and put on the whole armour of God and by faith go forth to battle and by faith lay hold of the promises of God. By faith seek to pluck and pry out the hand of the mighty and by faith praise our God and shout defiance at the enemy Amen. in the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And the final step is found in Hebrews 4 and verse 11. This is what it says. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Above all else, we should bear in mind that true faith is perfect rest. All labour and all the conflict with the enemy leads to this. Now, faith has been aptly described by some as, you know this, forsaking all by taking. That's an acrostic. For F A I T H. Ah. Forsaking all I take him. That's a good definition, isn't it? How much of the all includes many Christians never learn? All our sins, of course, all our righteousness, our self complacency, our self confidence, our doubts, our fears, our unbelief and suspicion. And then to enter into the rest of faith, to sink into the will of God, to take all that, to take all that comes and all he sends with joy. This is rest. When we are unable to consciously believe that all is made over to him and accepted in a covenanted order in all things and sure. That is the rest of faith. <clears throat> covenant you know it's a promise yeah. God's promised to do these things for us yeah. within the compass of these eight, eight words let us labour to enter into that rest the two remotest opposites appear yeah. labour and rest mm -hmm. <clears throat> some few forsake their righteousness mm -hmm. a few more forsake their sins but alas, what a labour is often to forsake our doubts and our fears and unbelief. How desperately the sin that does so easily beset us hinders us from entering in. Many, alas, alas, never realise or appropriate their foe. Hmm. And yet only as we do and steadfastly believe shall we ever press into the fullness of of the blessed rest of faith, mm. which is truly the gift of our loving Father in heaven. That's the most precious thing. Mm. Yeah. The rest of faith. Finally, we read it earlier on, Psalm 95. The Holy Spirit speaks of my work, my ways, my wrath, my rest and laments that though Israel of old saw God's work at Massa and Meribath, the smitten rock of Calvary as found in Exodus 17 and the exalted rock of Pentecost in Numbers 21, and saw his works and drank of the double stream, alas, they never entered into God's rest and gave as the reason that they were ignorant of his ways. He made known his ways to Moses and his mm. acts unto the children of Israel. Moses alone knew God's ways, the inner ways of his continual presence and power. Are we like the Israelites of old? Or have we, like Moses, learned of the ways of God 
and entered into the rest of faith. Mm. Faith is the most precious thing. And I want us to learn some of the principles because we, we get all the <laughs> happy clappy and all the rest of it. Mm. But there's a whole lot beneath that. Yeah. That's why I was talking today about this, to give some sort of foundation for that faith. And we need to be looking at its hindrances. We talk about his rest, but what does it actually mean? Mm. You know, I meet so many people, you know, and they're frothing, you know. <laughs> They've got no rest. <laughs> We've got to really, truly believe that God is powerful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. And we're going, to, mm. we're going to carry on. This was my father's favourite song. He used to say, some people's voices rank amongst the nightingales, mm. but mine ranks amongst the crows. <laughs> <laughs>